My God. My God, why are you forsaking me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? My God. I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others, and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver, let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet, it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast, and on you I was cast from my birth. Since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in a dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircle me. My hands and feet are shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing it casts lots. But you... Lord, do not be far away. On my help come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. My life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell your name to my brothers and sisters. In you the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. He did not despise or abhor the affliction or the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes the praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the end of the year shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For domination belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who seep and bow down. Before him shall bow all who go to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1. Isn't it good that the Christian faith is not bland, it is not sentimental, it is not anodyne, it is not escapist, and it cannot be put safely away in a box called religion? It embraces the whole of life and all that life contains. The gospel could not be good news if it didn't embrace the pain, the struggle, the anger, the hurt, the wounds, the sorrows, the darkness that mark the reality of human life. The revelation of the word of God that we call the Bible depicts the reality of human weakness and sin in almost every dimension. It shows us what we are like as human beings and what we are capable of. It holds a mirror up to human life, to our lives. It reveals also the extraordinary love and grace and mercy of God revealed supremely in Jesus Christ. And the prayer book in the middle that we call the Psalms brings to God the unvarnished prayers of the heart of the psalmists. Alongside the praise which oxygenates the life of the faithful and is essential for our spiritual health, we find also in the Psalms the reality of anger, of grief, 
of despondency, of dereliction, even of vengefulness. What human beings really do feel is being brought to God. Everything is brought to God. That is how it should be. Why? Because there is nothing beyond or outside of God's knowledge, God's love, God's redeeming. So holding up that template to our lives, how does it look? How does it feel? Are we as honest to God as the psalmist is? Do we praise God daily in the midst of all the other stuff we are experiencing? And the Psalms were the prayer book of Jesus. Jesus prayed the Psalms. We might even say Jesus inhabited the Psalms just as we are invited to do, entering into what the Psalmist is actually expressing. The church has often tried to sanitize the Psalms to make them less shocking, editing out, in particular, passages expressing the desire for revenge. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was adamant that we should do no such thing. God is the God of truth and the God of the whole of life. We need to pray the whole of the Psalms as they are written expressing in doing this a solidarity with humanity in its brokenness, disorder and anguish, and acknowledging that we are capable of every emotion expressed in the Psalms. The journey of faith is not about becoming more religious, it is about becoming more fully human. It is a journey into life, life in all its fullness. Jesus comes to redeem us in our humanity, not in our religiosity. So the Psalms show us that we are to speak or cry out from the heart, from the gut even, and not stay safely in our heads, or what R.S. Thomas calls the mind's kingdom. There is a directness of speech in the Psalms. Why do you cut me off? Why do you hide your face from me, O God? Psalm 88. Will you forget me forever? Psalm 13. Let burning coals fall on them. Let them be flung into pits, never more to rise. Psalm 140. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. We find a brutal honesty in Paul too, confessing we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Paul speaking, Paul writing from the heart, from the reality of his experience. We find something of this raw honesty in a prayer Teresa of Avila is said to have prayed. Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. The point to note is that all these psalms and all these prayers are addressed to God. Therefore, they are expressions of faith. Trusting that God is big enough to take whatever we throw at him. And God would surely much rather this directness and honesty than polite prayers that have no connection to our heart or gut. This brings me to prison. I visit the prisons in this diocese when I can. I have been confirming in them. And what a joy it is to see God at work. Few of these men have been trained in polite religion. They speak as they find. Many are open to the gospel of forgiveness, knowing that they have indeed truly messed up. Many are indeed hungry for that gospel. Amongst those confirmed, I have listened to their life stories. They tell me in one way or another of having come 
to the end of themselves. It's often been a journey through much crime, imprisonment, drugs, violence, and all sorts of other addictions. They tell of a journey of going to the absolute depths of despair. And from that place of deep darkness and need, crying out to God and discovering through that deep cry, truly, existentially, longing for God to come, crying to God out of the depths, God responds, God comes to meet them. Something happens between them and God. The other men and prison officers can see a difference in the men who have discovered God's mercy. Today we see the agony and passion of Christ and hear his cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are not to turn away, to look the other way or to close our eyes to this cry however tempted we may be to do so. And the writer to the Hebrews says of Jesus on the cross, he died with loud cries and tears. We are not to pass by on the other side. It is the crucified and God forsaken Christ who gives hope to the hopeless, the wounded Christ who brings healing to the wounded, by whose wounds we are healed. Bonhoeffer wrote from prison just before he was executed, God lets himself be pushed out of the world onto the cross. He is weak and powerless in the world, and that is precisely the way, the only way, in which he is with us and helps us. Only a suffering God can help.